Hello dear friends, thanks for joining me again for our second last study in this series of Afternoon Teas. Um, as you know, we've been looking at the Pilgrim Songs, the Songs of the Saints. Today we look at Psalm 133. Uh, let me read it as we start. Psalm 133, a song of ascents of David. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life evermore. Now that phrase, um, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life evermore, with which the psalm ends, of course links back to Zion, uh, the mountains of Zion, the temple, uh, Jerusalem, the imagery of Aaron and the collar of his robes. All of this places this psalm within the temple and on Mount Zion. And of course that is quite consistent with these pilgrim songs. Remember that the pilgrim songs celebrate the journey to Jerusalem of the Israelites, um, traveling up in obedience to the Lord, celebrating the great festivals, meeting together in the place where God has caused his name to dwell, the place of the Lord's dwelling, which is also then the place of blessing. And we've seen that time and time again in these songs, that to be in the presence of the Lord is to be in the place of blessing. It's the Lord who bestows blessing. It is the Lord indeed, verse 3, who gives eternal life. And so as the believers celebrate the Lord and his gifts, they think about this great blessing of eternal life, which is to be enjoyed in his presence. In fact, eternal life and the presence of the Lord are almost synonymous with each other because to be cut off from the Lord, as we know from the Garden of Eden story, Genesis 3, is to be cut off from the tree of life. But to be in the presence of the Lord is to be able to enjoy life evermore. So it's a wonderful picture of God bestowing his blessing of everlasting life upon his people. However, the psalm begins with a statement. And the statement is a very, very important one. How good it is, or how good and pleasant it is, when brothers dwell in unity. Now, good and pleasant are words worth thinking about. Good is more objective. In other words, what the psalmist is saying, objectively speaking, is that unity amongst believers is a good thing. Um, it's good because it's linked to the Lord who calls his people to unity, the Lord who is good. It's good because it's linked to that experience of blessing and eternal life. So unity amongst believers is a good thing in and of itself, but it's also a pleasant thing. That is, it's a good thing for those who experience it. Uh, to experience disunity, and I, I'm sure you'll be aware of this, if you've ever experienced any kind of, of rupture of relationships or or break up of relationships amongst believers, or perhaps witness something like that in a church that you're aware of, where the church has split, some terrible things that have happened. Um, it's such a depressing and such a de it's such a discouraging experience when we have to deal with Christians who are at loggerheads with one another. The Apostle Paul throughout his ministry had to deal with Christians who were fighting with each other. And he keeps reminding them of the fact that unity is something to which we are called as believers. In fact, Ephesians is the great letter about Christian unity. God breaking down walls of division and uniting Jew and Gentile in the case of Ephesians. So here is a psalm which celebrates the unity of believers, something that Jesus said was so important, that you may be one even as the Father and I am one. He said, Jesus called us to unity. But from the very beginning of God's people, unity amongst believers was something really, really good from God's point of view and pleasant from the experience of those who enjoyed it. We have two similes in the psalm. They might seem rather strange ones to you. Uh, this unity described as precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, on the collar of his robe. Now, I think what we need to remember is that anointing with oil uh, was often a symbol of, of hospitality. When you entered um, someone's home, then you were anointed with oil. In fact, uh, just on Sunday, as we looked at Luke 7 with Scott, 
and the story of the woman who anointed Jesus' head and, uh, and washed his feet with her tears. Um, so the woman shows Jesus the hospitality that Simon the Pharisee did not show him. So the anointing with oil is a symbol of hospitality as much as it is a symbol of consecration. And probably both of these ideas are here. So those who are set apart for the Lord are welcomed into his presence, do you see? And the, the idea of hospitality is there because the Lord is the host, like in Psalm 23, where the Lord sets a table for us in the presence of our enemies. The Lord in his temple is the host of his people, and he welcomes them into his home. And uh, so this image of hospitality is there. But of course, Aaron's name being mentioned and the collar of his robe being mentioned highlights the temple idea. So it's not just that God is um, urging us to live in unity. It's not just God, that God is saying that Christian unity is like the joy of hospitality. And indeed, that hospitality should always be characterized by unity. No one wants to go into someone's home to have a fight. No one wants to enter someone's home together with other people and end up in an argument over lunch. So the, the picture of hospitality and unity go together. In fact, it's a family picture, ideally. Um, brothers here, verse 1, brothers and sisters. There's the family image here of Christian family together in the home, enjoying hospitality, perhaps enjoying a good meal. And around the table, there isn't division and discord, but rather harmony and joy and peace. But the imagery of the, of the collar of Aaron's robe and Aaron's beard reminds us that the one who is the host is the Lord in his temple. So think how that fits into the pilgrim songs. The pilgrim songs are all about a journey. They're about a journey between redemption and joy and peace and blessing in the presence of the Lord. A journey from exclusion to inclusion. A journey from being outside to being inside. A journey, if you like, towards the promised land and towards the place of God's dwelling. And so as they arrive at this place of dwelling, what do they experience? The answer is they experience God's rich welcome, everlasting life and his blessing, and they experience deep unity among themselves. Now, just in recent times, there's been a lot of discussion and debate around issues of ethnicity. Um, we've had conversations about that at St. James. Um, we've been reminded again on Women's Day on Sunday of the importance of uh, respect and care and love um, for women and girl children in our community. Um, we've talked a great deal about the fact that as Christians, we should not be characterized by divisions and by racial prejudice or snobbery um, or ethnic prejudice or anything like that. Can you see how this psalm really speaks into this world of ours at this time? How important it is. What we are reminded of in this psalm is that Christian community should be united. And that when we welcome people into church and into the community of God's people, their experience should be one of unity, of good and pleasant oneness, togetherness, because we all have one great thing in common. And of course, that is the Lord who gives his blessing and who gives life evermore. Each and every Christian, irrespective of who they are, belongs to the Lord Jesus. Each and every Israelite belong to the Lord. And so as the psalm celebrates the unity of God's people, because he has redeemed them, because he has called them to himself and because he has given them this place of blessing. So we who know this redemption in an even deeper and more profound way in the death and resurrection of Jesus should be committed to this unity. Jesus prayed for the unity of his church. Unity, of course, means that we need from time to time to forgive one another. Unity, of course, means that we need not to make a big fuss about things that don't matter. Unity means that we put the main thing as the main thing and that we keep the gospel from our point of view, the gospel central. And we see that in the gospel, God is bringing together, as Scott reminded us in that wonderful series about scattering and gathering. God is bringing together in the gospel men and women, old and young, 
from every tribe and tongue and nation under heaven to be part of his one people of God. And what a wonderful thing, what a good and pleasant thing it is when Christians dwell together in unity. May God grant that that is our experience, for there the Lord has commanded his blessing, and there we enjoy and celebrate the abundant life that is ours in Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining me. Tomorrow we end with Psalm 134. It's a great invitation to praise and to worship and to lift up our hands in the presence of the Lord who calls us to be part of his family. See you tomorrow.